Hi folks, I'm Rich Folley. You're watching our continuing coverage of AWP 2018 on PBS Books, brought to you by PBS's The Great American Read series. Coming to TV stations and public broadcasting stations this spring and fall. And I'm right now with Kiese Lehman, who's the author of an upcoming book that's getting a lot of buzz these days called Heavy, which we're going to talk about, but also another book called Long Division. First of all, I really appreciate you joining us here in the PBS. Yeah, yeah thanks for having me. I'm yeah. happy to be here. Yeah, so t tell me a little bit about, the other day I'm reading Twitter and I, I see Roxane Gay tell me that she's read a book called Heavy that she needs to tell us about right now, that this thing changed her, it rocked your world. I called you up immediately and that's got to feel good when a book that you've written is now getting some of that attention and love for that. It feels good to get attention, but particularly it feels good to get attention from Roxanne because she's just a literary force that I've never seen or imagined in my life. So we sent the book to her and, you know, who knew if she was going to respond or not, but when she actually, she sent an email to me before she posted on Twitter and I just couldn't believe that she was so moved by the project. Uh, and, and our books are sort of in conversation with one another, so I was really happy that she appreciated what I was trying to do. Right, she'd written the book, obviously, Hunger, yep. which is like, gained so much attention right now. Absolutely. Yours, Heavy, is different. It's about basically thinking about losing weight and, the, and, and your relationship to weight. Right. But there's more to it. Can you explain a little bit about the book and, and, and how it all came to be for you? Yeah, I mean, the book, in some ways, is about the weight of sexual violence, the weight of actually like just violence in this nation um, and how we bear that weight and often how that weight breaks us, uh, whether we admit it or not. And so it's a book that, you know, I started out trying to lose 150 pounds. I was going to talk to my grandmother and my mother along the way about their experiences with food, their experiences with violence, sexual violence particularly. Uh, somewhere along the way, I just was like, you know, if I really want to do this project justice, I need to talk to them. I need to write to them about my experiences. And so I started jotting no notes down and I just started writing. And before I knew it, it became a different project. Um, which was much more about the way I bore weight, physical weight, emotional weight, psychological weight. And um, yeah, and really it's about the intimate relationship with, with my mother. Yep. So what, did, did your mother understand this project, what she was getting into when you started going down that path? And she knows you well now. <laughs> she knows who you are and how you probably are observing so much as you go forward. What was her thoughts about it? Um, you know, I, I, was a, I was the only child. My mother had me, she was 19, so we were, we, you know, we vacillated between mother and child and best friend and best friend. And so she, she, she raised me to be sort of audacious. So she knew I was going to do something kind of out the box. I don't think she knew she was going to be so central in it. Um, but she's happy, you know what I mean? Like the book allowed us to talk about things that we just never would have talked about, particularly issues of, of not just, again, not just physical weight and weight loss, but, but the weight of violence and the weight of, you know, parental uh, child relationships, it gave us an opportunity to really sit in things we just did not ever think we would sit and talk about. And, and my mother is someone who's always about progress. She's always about going forward, right? And my book is about, in some way, about the importance of looking back at the messiness, the residual residue, and uh, ultimately, the version you got, I don't know if it had her thing at the end, but she writes like the little afterward to the book, and I'm just grateful, man, because she could have I guess she could have tried to disown me after the book, but <laughs> she did. Did you show it to her while you were writing it, or did you wait until yeah, it was I showed done? Yeah, I showed her pieces along the way. I wanted her to be more central in the writing. I wanted, you know, at one point I wanted us to have alternating chapters. You know, she's got a real job. She, she didn't have time for all of that. But, yeah, I mean, those conversations weren't always nice, but... She, part, you know, she was she was interested. You talked about how the book totally shifted, and, and, and you know that it really was sort of a weight loss story. It was a weight loss book, and from there, it took on the idea of 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 weight, the weight yeah. of everything, sexual yeah. violence. Talk yeah. about the sexual violence part and, and, and where that comes well, in. Well, well, I'll just start first and say, like, you know, it, it became it became obvious to me that it was easier in my family to talk about physical weight gain, physical weight loss, than to talk about you know what precipitated the weight gain or weight loss to talk about the consequences of the weight gain or weight loss. And when I started talking and thinking about my family and other people I knew, I'm not trying to make a causal relationship between sexual violence and weight gain or loss, but in almost everybody's experience, there were stories about sexual violence, either as perpetrators or you know folks who had been victimized. And these are stories people didn't want to talk about. And so I just thought, you know, if people don't want to talk about these stories, do I want to talk about them? And so, you know, when I was young, um, I was sexually abused by an older woman who I have now learned to appreciate and 
care for to some degree. And I just never talked to my mom about much of that. Did and she know about it at all? No, nah, she, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, memory's interesting, man. I, I, I think she knew about it, but she said she didn't know about it, you know? Um, but in addition to sexual violence, I'm also exploring, like, the book is really about the words we use to evade dealing and reckoning with sexual violence, and the words we use to evade dealing with, you know, racial terror and other forms of violence. And um, so my mother talks a lot in the book about her experiences too, but she doesn't talk at all about her experiences with sexual violence, and that's something I wasn't trying to push her into. But I just thought as, you know, as a writer, an author, I needed to do the work of talking about my experiences with it um, if I was going to talk about other people's experience. So, my, my, yeah. So you, you told me your mom was raised you to be audacious yeah. and feel confident. Uh, where did that writing thing come from for you? Where did, it, where did you realize that you had a talent for putting words on paper yeah, or just kind of I, pulling these ideas together? I don't know if I had a talent or not, but my mother was a, uh, she was, she had me with 19, she was in school. So I was, I was conceived and born on Jackson State University's campus. She became a, she went to graduate school. She became a professor. We moved back to Jackson where she became a professor at Jackson State. So I spent all of my time as a young kid really on that campus around books. And she was definitely one of these mothers who was like, you can't do anything you want to do until you read and write. And so I played a lot of sports as a kid, but I could not do what I wanted to do until I read or write. So I was just very versed in the practice of reading and writing. I don't know if it was a talent, but it was just something that I had to do um, before I could play football, play basketball, read the books I wanted to read. I had to read what she wanted me to read. And so I think that that sort of instilled in me like a ritual like you know I still had the same ritual I had when I was like eight years old you know I wake up have to write for an hour or two before I go to bed I have to write for an hour or two and I, you know she's responsible for for that ritual and that way she's responsible for my being a writer so you found that you were getting better at this you've written you've, oh, you've written yeah. you have other books that have been published we mentioned long division earlier this one is a different kind of book yep and the, the, the whole conception of this book was different than anything you've ever done before Oh, absolutely have, how do you notice the sort of progression of yourself as a writer as you go forward? That's a great question. That's a great question. You know, I had to write, my first book, Long Division, is like a metafictive post-Katrina book. And really it was like a kind of experiment. Um, I had to write that book, which was a very hard book to pull off in order to really think I could do something like this. Because again, like this book is, it's a memoir, but it's, a, it's also a memoir that's at once a failed weight loss story. It's a memoir where I'm talking, there's a direct address directly to my mother. I haven't seen that kind of memoir before. And it's not using my mother as like a, um, like a apparatus. Like I'm literally talking to her. Do you know what I'm saying? So I had to write those two. I had to write the novel and I had to write the essay book in order to get to a place where I could dare to do some of the things I'm trying to do in, in this memoir. Yeah. Um, yeah. You talk about dare. I mean, that's like, uh, I, I, that was going to be my next question. Where do you find the confidence to, to deconstruct this book that you thought you were going to write and to recognize that there's something deeper there and you, you have no choice but to follow it down that path and to bring these other people in your life into it too? Yeah, a lot of it, again, is, you know, my mother raised her child, right? Like, and I'm, like her, I'm very audacious, but I also had a job. Like, a lot, I mean, if I didn't have a job, I was a professor, I had tenure, so I wasn't writing to eat. You know what I mean? I was writing because I love to read and write, but sometimes I think about like how if I was trying to make writing my only job, I don't know if I would have done this. I wouldn't, have, I mean, no, I know I wouldn't have done it because the cost would have been too much, right? It takes a lot of time to write a book like this. And who knows when you put a book out like this if people are gonna uh, gravitate to it or not. But one thing that helped me was that I had like a steady job. I had a job for life. You know, I have tenure at a university. So, you know, beyond like audacity and courage, there's like a practical, I'm gonna be all right whether the book comes out or not. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember talking to Roxanne on, on this couch a couple of years ago here, and I asked her, are you gonna stay at Purdue? And she's like, I, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, and you can see now, finally, like there's this time where she's one of the most successful writers you'll see out there, and yet she's been tethered to that two job thing too for a long time, maybe I like not the, I so love much. that about her though. You know, like, I love that Roxanne Gay right now, well, first of all, I wanna say, I don't, She's one of the few writers in the world who has completely obliterated the genre of the essay genre. You know, Bad Feminist broke every record you could imagine. The fictive genre, 
um, the memoir genre with, with, with hunger. She's writing comic books. She's writing film. And she's, I think Twitter is a genre. You know what I oh, mean? Yeah. Like she's just, she's tearing Twitter up. Um, and I love that she's doing what she's doing and she could be anywhere she wants to be. And she chose to be in the center. You know, I'm not trying to say, you know, if she leaves Purdue, she leaves. But I just think it's amazing that the coast haven't taken her. Like, you know, the, the coast, they're, I mean, you're from Detroit. On her. You they're, know, they're pulling on her. <laughs> yeah. But I'm just saying, as, you know, as of right now, like the coast haven't like completely consumed. Yeah. So, yeah. so how does how does being a professor ground you as you're thinking about these things? And I mean, you're, you're going home and you're writing your story, very personal stuff. Then you're going in and you're inspiring a, a new generation of writers. Right. You. I'm a teacher, man. I'm a teacher. And I write in order to sort of be a better teacher. I, I write in order to learn things myself. But that's my, that's what I, you know, like teaching is where I get the most, for the, you know, I'm, I'm most fortified through teaching. I learn the most about the craft of writing through reading my students' work. Um, I learn patience. You have to have narrative patience to do this writing thing. I learned a lot of patience in dealing with my students. So I don't know what I would do, actually, if I wasn't a teacher. I think the teaching actually helps um, whatever I'm able to do well, I think the teaching helps it, for sure. And then here you are at AWP, and there's there's already a, sort of a groundswell beginning for Heavy. What's the when does it come out? The date? Yeah, the date uh, is October 16th. You know, we'll see if it get mo if it gets moved up. Maybe yeah. it will, maybe it won't. We'll mm -hmm. see. But uh, if it doesn't get moved up, it's gonna come out October 16th. Right. So there's already this discussion about it. You're walking down the hallways. People are already asking you about it. Right. It's gotta feel pretty good. And a piece, some of your work that isn't even in the world yet yeah. is uh, starting to generate. I that mean, kind it's of heat. scary, man. It's scary, but that book was so hard to write, dog. I'm just happy that shit is over with. You know <laughs> what I mean? Honestly, I'm just happy that it's over, and I'm and I'm I'm still trying to deal with the emotion of people wanting to 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 put their hands on it because it's such a it's literally such a bodily book, but it's also a raw book. So I'm, a, I'm afraid of, I'm afraid in a way of what people are gonna do once they get their hands on it. But more than afraid, I'm just happy that I was able to do that. I'm happy that uh, Scribner supported me in doing that. Yeah, it's bold. You put your, you put your life on those pages. Yeah. And, uh, and it's gonna be in other people's hands soon. And right now you're in this kind of quiet period where right. it isn't yet. Except for a few. So. Right. I love the quiet period, too. That's my problem. <laughs> this is my first time coming to uh, AWP because, because I love the quiet. You know, I, I'm a, I'm a, I left New York to move back to Mississippi, right? Like, I, I kind of like to be in the cut, like in the shadow a little bit. So we'll see what happens when the all book right. comes out. I'm, 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 I'm going to protect it. my time, though, for sure. I'm sure you are. Well, uh, Kiese Lehman, it's so cool to meet you. I can't wait for Heavy. In the meantime, there's... For all the people who are new to your work, they can go find you. You have other published work, Long Division and others, and so the Book of Essays. So yep. continue to do that. Thank you so much, and I can't wait to see what I happens. I appreciate it, man. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks Thank for you. joining us Thank today. you. Thank you.